Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a real treat. The conductor reviews his own recording. You'll see what I mean in a second. The recording in question is this. Gershwin's Complete Music for Piano and Orchestra, the fabulous, famous, classic Vox recording featuring pianist Jeffrey Siegel and the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra under Leonard, Leonard Slatkin with trumpeter Susan Slaughter. This is just a marvelous disc, and it's the second of two. Remember, they released a, what was a three LP or two CD set of the complete Gershwin music for piano and orchestra and orchestra orchestra. And so far, um, number one was released, and I said, well, gee, the piano stuff must be coming. And sure enough, it was coming. But Leonard Slatkin himself saw my video of number one and wrote me a marvelous letter, which he gave me permission to use in talking about number two, about the background to this particular recording, which contains the concerto in F, the second Rhapsody, the variations on I Got Rhythm, and of course, Rhapsody in Blue, the whole shebangy complete, which is of course essential. These are great performances, wonderfully recorded, and I, I, most people know about them if they don't know them specifically. They are certainly mandatory acquisitions for your Gershwin collection. And well, let's let uh, Maestro Slatkin give us the skinny on how this came to be and how he feels about it, which is really very, very interesting, as you'll see. Here we go. Hi, Dave. A friend sent me your post about the reissue of this. This was the first Gershwin disc. Boy, do I have stories which you might want to pass along when the piano orchestra stuff comes out. And who am I to say no? As you hinted at, this Gershwin set really was the first thing that St. Louis, that the St. Louis Symphony recorded since Previn did the Red Pony Suite and the Sinfonia de Requiem back in the 60s. Management made a deal with the orchestra in Vox so that recordings would be part of the contractual commitment and the musicians did not have, did not receive extra payment for them. It's always a good way to do it, isn't it? Oh, let me get up this thing up here a minute. Wait a minute. I have to... I have to diddle this. There we go. Walter Suskind, who was, of course, the music director, rightfully should have made the first discs. But everybody knew that Gershwin, especially with what would be the first set of all his orchestral music, would make a bigger impact. Suskind very generously allowed me to do this, and I will never forget that kindness. We did not have a lot of recording time to do, to do, to do what back then? Oh, let me do this properly. We did not have a lot of recording time to do what back then were three discs. There, I got it. I believe it was just five sessions for all the repertoire. None of us knew Elite, that was the recording company group there, but it was clear from the outset that Joanna Nickrens um, had, had razor sharp ears and Mark Obort, the other part of Elite, could really capture the sound of Powell. But the sessions were in the summer at a time when we were not playing in the hall. Instead, we had two performances to get the music at least played. Yeah, here we go. The concerts were outdoors. One got rained out, and for the other, the pianist Jeffrey Siegel had a kidney stone. So he really only got to perform once, but it at least gave us a chance to get a feel for the lesser played works. Think back and you will remember quadraphonic sound. This gimmick was supposed to be another selling point for the records. When we did the Cuban Overture, which takes eight percussionists, we put the Latin ones out in the audience so the separation could make them appear on the rear channels. I believe that the only way you could hear that now is to get one of the original pressings, which of course leads me to wonder if Naxos is going to issue them as LPs. My mother came in to help out, but not as a cellist. You remember that Slatkin's mother was one of the great performers in the Hollywood String Quartet and was a studio musician of the first rank. This gimmick was supposed to be another selling point for the records. Slatkin's mother, by the way, was Eleanor Aller. That was her name. When we did the Cuban Overture, which takes... Oh, I'm sorry about that. We just did that. Um, with all of her studio... Oh, okay, let me get this straight. My mother came in to help out, but not as a cellist. With all of her studio work, she did not know Gershwin, but she could help us a bit stylistically. We had a lot to do quickly, but the orchestra was just terrific and handled the pressure well. It happened that a couple days ago, I went to a ball game with the former principal trumpet, Susan Slaughter. 
um, if one compared the two discs we made of the same repertoire, the other for EMI, you would hear some drastic differences. The early versions are probably closer to the styles of the 20s and 30s. As time marched on, we started putting more jazz inflections in it. I asked Susan, if you are doing American in Paris and get to the two big solos, which style do you default to? Unquote. She thought about it and said that it was probably the more straightforward version. Now that no one is left to really understand how to do it, most musicians overdo this. I can only say that they must think of Fred Astaire. And of course, very few remember him either. I haven't listened to the reissue yet. People say the sound is great. I am worried that I might not hear what I remember or that the actual listening experience may not be up to, some me be up to those memories. I wonder if EMI will reissue the discs we did for them when I turn 80 next year. Hint, hint. Good idea, Warner. You know, start working on it. The piano pieces will come out soon. Yes, here they are. Ta-da! And Jeffrey was so good with these, recalling a bit of Oscar Levant. Indeed, he was. He's splendid. I also know, let me see, that Naxos will put out the three Prokofiev film scores that we did. All the CD issues of Ivan the Terrible left out the narration, which we did in English. There was not available time back then to put it in, so there's something to look forward to. One last thing. Hang on one second here. Let me just, let me just get the rest of this thing up here so that we can finish. There we go. One last thing. We had four minutes left in the final Gershwin session. The promenade was done in a single take as we had run out of time. You do not hear better clarinet playing from anyone than George Sif Silfies for that gem. Hope all is well, Leonard. Thank you so much, Maestro Slatkin. That was wonderful. And you know, pardon me for garbling some of it, you know, when you're trying to look into the camera and read at the same time and get the thing to scroll up. I mean, it's not like I have a teleprompter here. But there you have it. An absolutely spectacular Gershwin disc of the music for piano and orchestra on Vox featuring Jeffrey Siegel, Leonard Slatkin, the St. Louis Symphony, Susan Slaughter on trumpet, and Eleanor Aller on the previous disc somewhere. Really just a terrific pair of discs and the birth of quite an impressive recorded legacy featuring Slatkin in St. Louis, which of course had its successors not on Vox, but on RCA and EMI, as Maestro Slatkin pointed out, and also on Telarc. Some amazing, amazing stuff. A legacy that deserves to be preserved. It's all ripe for reissue. Hopefully it'll show up. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me, and thanks again to Maestro Slatkin for this wonderful insight and backstory. Take care.